Welcome to the second lecture of the course, Introduction to Data Analytics. In this session, we are going to continue from uh, our previous session where we presented uh, to you a brief overview of what we are going to be covering in this course. And we started off talking about in the previous session, we spoke about descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, uh, the use of ANOVA in inferential statistics and finally, we spoke about regression and uh, regression analysis and, and how we would be uh, using that and we would be talking about that in this course. Um, we now move on to the next uh, session of the course, uh, which is machine learning. Uh, again, just to remind all of you there, uh, this is not the introduction to machine learning part of the course. This is the part where I'm just giving you an overview of everything that we're going to be covering in this course. Obviously, with each session, we're going to separately introduce the topic and go over it in great detail um, during that particular session. But this is just, again, to give you an idea of what it is that we're going to be covering in this course. So let's talk about machine learning. Uh, machine learning is what we feel is um, a primary focus in this course uh, and having covered concepts in probability, statistics and uh, also in, with regression analysis should set you up fairly robustly for understanding, uh, inferential, for understanding machine learning. So many of you might have heard of the words machine learning, come across it in uh, some form or the other or you might have also come across uh, machine learning uh, through one of its related topics. Uh, so you might have come across data mining, uh, or you, may, you might have heard of the terms data mining, you might have heard of the term pattern recognition or statistical learning in some cases. Now all of these are highly related topics but they're not necessarily the same. Um, for instance, the focus on the machine learning um, is more a focus on the algorithms themselves that are going to be used to convert uh, data into use, usable knowledge. So, and that's also going to be the focus of this particular course. So, let's, let's talk broadly about machine learning. Um, the topic of machine learning is itself broadly divided into two areas, one of supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And now I'm going to give you a brief idea of uh, what we seek to achieve in both these topics separately. So let's for instance take supervised learning. Before we jump into a definitional understanding of supervised learning, you already saw the first uh, glimpses of what supervised learning tries to do. Uh, and you saw that when you um, covered the module on regression analysis. Now, to jump into the definition, the core idea of supervised learning is essentially a task of creating a function or a relationship from training data, so based off of historic data, which has at least one explicit output variable. Traditionally, this is also indicated as data that is labeled, so that's coming from the computer science camp where people say the data is labeled. Um, but what that essentially means, if you're not familiar with that terminology, is there is this, this clear single variable which I can call as the output variable and I'm primarily interested in create a functional or, or algorithmic mapping between this output variable and one or more input variables that I might have. <clears throat> so that's a supervised learning. And we can take the same examples that we were looking at when we were speaking about a regression analysis um, as examples of supervised learning. So you might have data where one of your inputs is something like the rainfall and your output is the crop yield. Um, or you might have data which says that um, your input is the square footage of the house and your output for instance could be the price of the house. Um, again, um, there are many, many, many examples we can think of. But a supervised learning is this idea that uh, you have an output variable and your primary focus is to either predict the output variable or create a functional relationship between the inputs and outputs which uh, can be used or is useful um, for the future. 
Now, within supervised learning itself, uh, there are two broad uh, classes of problems. Now, this classification of problems does not mean the algorithms themselves are really different. So, essentially, your um, the idea here is that your supervised learning problems can be classified into two broad classes and they are called classification problems and regression problems. Um, the word regression means something quite different here, it does not mean the exact same thing as a regression analysis, but once I explain this, um, this division you will understand better. <coughs> classification problems are essentially problems where you are still trying to do what supervised learning tries to do which is uh, create a relationship between the inputs to the output. But here your output variable is a discrete categorical variable uh, and more often than not it is a nominal categorical variable meaning uh, there is no explicit ordering of the, uh, of the classes. Um, so, an example of this could be something like your output uh, variable is either male or female. So, you are trying to predict something and the output variable is not something like the previous example where we said how much what the crop yield was. So, how much crop did I get is a continuous variable meaning uh, 20 kgs or whatever per hectare is a very diff is, is exactly twice 10 kgs per hectare. So, that is a continuous variable you can get any value between 0 to infinity or negative uh, infinity to infinity. Um, but uh, with classification problems you are trying to predict based on the inputs as to which class the output variable should belong to and that just means that the output variable is discretized and uh, in all uh, likelihood it is a categorical variable and it is typically nominal. Now, move on to the class of problems which are called regression problems within supervised learning that just again quite simply means the output variable is a continuous quantitative variable such as um, the crop yield um, given, given some amount of rainfall, how much crop are you going to get uh, given the rainfall. Um, the methods themselves are just marginally different and many of the supervised learning tools and techniques are perfectly capable of being deployed in classification scenarios as well as uh, regression scenarios and but at the same time there are techniques which are just suited for one of the two um, and you need to make some modifications to the technique for it to apply to the other. But we will we'll be discussing this uh, dichotomy as we go through the course also and I, even as we go through the techniques themselves we will talk about them a little bit. We now move on to unsupervised learning and I'll, let me just give you a brief idea of uh, what we will be covering in unsupervised learning. Um, unsupervised learning is the task of creating patterns from data which have no explicit measure or signal guiding us. In other words, there is no single variable which we can call as our output variable. Again, here people say the data is unlabeled. But ultimately, if, if, if you are familiar with that terminology, great. So, you can think of it as labeled data for supervised learning, unlabeled data for unsupervised. Um, I find it easier to think of it as with supervised learning, there is an explicit output variable. With unsupervised learning, there is not one or two, you know, variables that I can just point to and say these are the output variables, these are the input variables. With unsupervised learning, you just have variables. Now that we have a basic definitional understanding of supervised and unsupervised learning, I am just going to give you some uh, idea of what are the tools and techniques that we are going to cover in them. I might not, I am not again because we are not in the supervised learning class, I am just giving you an overview. Uh, I am not going to go into what each of these techniques are, but this is more to just familiarize you um, with the names of these techniques and in some cases you might have come across or heard of these names somewhere. So, I just want to uh, make sure that you are familiar with them. So, with supervised learning, we are going to be looking, um, we would have finished our module on regression analysis. Uh, we will be looking a little bit at more advanced methods in regression, um, modifications that are uh, available with regression uh, analysis approaches. Um, 
we will be looking at logistic regression which is used for problems of classification, uh, a regression styled approach for uh, not predicting continuous output variables, but categorical output uh, variables. Um, we will talk about an algorithmic approach called KNN uh, methods. Um, you might, we might also come across uh, this module on classification and regression trees. Uh, it is also called CART, we will be talking about that. Uh, other methods that you will come across are support vector machines or SVMs, uh, linear and quadratic discriminant analysis, LDAs and QDAs, uh, artificial neural networks or ANNs and um, there are a breed of methods called ensemble methods which kind of uh, use multiple predictors together. So that is also something that we will be covering in this course. We do not stop at only tools and techniques because just knowing the tools and techniques um, and sometimes some of these tend to be buzzwords um, is good in that you, you know what you might be talking about, but you also want to understand some of the concepts that go behind um, creating some of these techniques and these concepts can be critical to fine tuning some of the parameters that are there in the techniques. So, we will be talking about some common supervised learning concepts called regularization, dimensionality reduction or cross validation and so on. And at this point if you do not understand some of these words that is fine, the purpose of this is to just uh, give you an idea of what it is that we will be covering. Fine. Now we then move on to unsupervised learning <clears throat> and in unsupervised learning um, there are two major areas that we, we would be covering. Uh, the first is the concept of clustering you might have heard of the word clustering and that is uh, a topic that we are going to cover in unsupervised learning. And uh, the next, uh, the other topic that we will be covering in unsupervised learning is called association rule mining. So, let me just briefly give you an idea of what clustering is and what association rule mining is. This way you will also get a slightly better idea of unsupervised learning. See with um, supervised learning you had the example of the regression, a very concrete example it is easy to imagine. But what does it mean to do machine learning where there is no output variable? What does that feel like? Perhaps talking through these two will give you some idea. With clustering the core goal is that it is a task of grouping a set of objects into clusters or, or you can think of them as group into groups uh, based on their similarities. How are these similarities defined? It is defined across a common set of attributes or features that each of these objects uh, have. Uh, and again the easiest way to digest what I just said, uh, but I will repeat it, um, is that clustering is the task of grouping a set of objects into clusters or groups based on their similarities. And these similarities are defined based on a common set of attributes or features. Uh, that these objects possess. So, let us take a couple of examples. Now, we understand a definitional uh, version of what uh, clustering is, but let us take a concrete uh, set of examples and maybe uh, what we mean by objects and what we mean by features becomes more obvious. Um, the easiest example to think of are customers. Uh, from a business for a business. So, let us say that I am uh, an online retailer or let us say I am uh, a, a taxi company, uh, take whichever business is close to your heart um, and let us say I had a database of my potential customers or maybe my current customers, either database. The objects here would be the customers. The features or attributes uh, are features and attributes associated with the customers. So, a simple feature could be is my customer male or female? Uh, another feature could be what is the age of my customer? Another feature could be is this a returning customer or is this a new customer? Um, another feature could be the actual amount of rupees per transaction spent by this customer each time they come to me. So, these are all some attributes and features associated with the customers, the customers are objects. So, what are we doing in a clustering? What we are doing is we grouping these uh, customers. And why would we want to do that? For various business reasons. 
if I can group these customers, so nobody is coming and telling me what's the right answer, wrong answer. There's no output variable. Um, but I've taken these customers and now I've created two or three groups. And that could help me in a variety of ways. Um, if I understand that there are only two or three types or groups of customers that come to me, knowing which group a particular customer belongs to might help me behave uh, differently potentially to the customer or I might institute certain policies in my business environment based on the groups that get uh, formed um, in my, in, in, um, b amongst my customers. So um, again, there are many, many examples. Uh, we just spoke about businesses and I mean customers for a business. Um, this has been quite prevalently used in biology, uh, for instance, where the object here are different genes and the different genes perform different functions. So these functions tend to be features or attributes. So can I group genes based on the functions that they perform? So that's um, one, uh, one application. Um, there are also many applications in medicines, right? So you have a whole plethora of disease and the disease form the objects, but are there a certain a set of symptoms or are there a certain set of um, uh, responses to treatments that these different disease have and so can I group these disease um, based on either the at, based on the attributes which could be symptoms or their responses to different kinds of treatments um, and, and for instance some a grouping like that might help establish um, wings in hospitals or medical treatment facilities where disease of a certain kind get grouped together and uh, people uh, are sent there. Now, this is just thinking aloud, it, it might be a good idea, it might not be a good idea, but the point is uh, clustering can enable you to create this kind, these kinds of groups uh, and how, the, how a business or an engineering application uses it uh, is more domain specific in that sense. Um, some of the techniques in clustering that we, we are going to be covering include KNN, so you might have heard it as K-means uh, clustering. Um, we are going to be talking about hierarchical clustering, uh, graph-based clustering and also density clustering. So this is just to give you some idea of the different types of clustering techniques that we are going to be covering in this course. Let us now talk a little bit about um, the other major unsupervised learning um, technique that the course is going to focus on uh, and this uh, is essentially association rule mining. Um, association rule mining uh, is essentially this task of identifying relationships between features across a set of objects. So keep the same uh, object and feature uh, definition that we created with the clustering, right? With clustering, your goal was to use the features and thereby group objects. With association rule mining, you want to use these objects, uh, you want to use this data essentially to create relationships between features. So let me, let me give you a, a concrete example and this is a seminal example uh, uh, that introduced in many ways association rule mining and it's called the market basket application. In fact association uh, rule mining was uh, you know at times also called like a market basket uh, analysis and so on. Um, the idea here is that uh, let's say you're a point of sale system, you're a supermarket and your rows or your objects are essentially customers and these customers uh, come in and they buy some subset of the products that you stock in the supermarket and the supermarket now represents this whole transaction where each row is a sale that a customer makes and the columns or the features are these different products that the, that the supermarkets uh, stocks. Um, so a particular sale will have a stream of zeros and ones where uh, if I did not take product A, I get marked a zero for that product. If I do take product B, then that's a one, right? So each sale, you can think of, you can think of this table where each sale is a row in that table. Each column is a product that the supermarket stocks. So if 
a particular sale uh, includes a certain product, then that's marked uh, as a binary. It, it's it's a binary system. It gets marked one, and if a particular sale does not have that product, it get marks. Uh, it gets marked zero. So let's say you have this table now. This table could potentially enable you to answer questions of the nature such as people who buy coffee and coffee would represent a particular column uh, in, in uh, the table. You could say something like people who buy milk tend to buy sugar, right? Because typically when there is a 1 in, in my data set, it looks like uh, under under the category milk, there also tends to be a one under the category sugar in my same data set. So, and and this can be extracted uh, to go beyond a one to one mapping. See, I gave you an example where people who tend to buy milk tend to buy sugar, um, but you have lots of other combinations. You can say things like people who buy coffee and milk tend to buy sugar, or people who buy milk almost never buy milk substitute. Right. So, why is this exciting? Well, now a supermarket knows where to keep which product in its uh, setup. So, you can lay things out where if coffee and milk are bought, bought together, can coffee and milk be next to each other um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but association rule mining again need not be confined to a market basket uh, context as long as you can again break down the data. Um, into uh, a simple thing of objects and features uh, that will enable you to uh, perhaps consider association rule mining. Um, but the important thing is again, look, there is no one variable that you are targeting. So, it is not a classification exercise, it is not a prediction exercise of uh, you know who is most likely to buy sugar, um, but it is that any variable can be uh, uh, can become the, the relationship variable. Um, so there's no there's no strict output variable. Um, within association rule mining, there are a couple of challenges, and we'll be talking about that as well in this course. So the idea of um, you know creating many complex rules becomes computationally very hard. So what do you do with that? And how do you how do you say a particular rule? And when I say a rule out here, I mean something like people who buy coffee and milk tend to buy sugar. Uh, how do you evaluate how good a particular rule is and that is some of the core challenges in association rule mining. Finally, we come to um, the last uh, module in this course overview and this is a module on creating data and uh, we, we feel fairly strong about uh, this module because we see that this is a problem that is often faced with uh, many uh, organizations where they are interested in data analytics, um, they are interested, uh, they see this uh, buzzword floating around sometimes big data and so on and, and they are a little unsure about how that applies to them when there just is no data available or they have not really captured it. And we feel like uh, a set of topics in, in here should uh, help companies or organizations understand uh, this part of the data analytics process better. So, there are three major topics that we are going to be covering here. The first topic is on design of experiments. So, you have no data, but you want to take a data centric approach. This whole idea of data driven decision making. You want the data to tell you what is the right thing to do. Perhaps the best thing for you to do is to conduct an experiment. Um, um, you try certain options uh, and essentially you explicitly change that input variable in different settings at different points of time and then see what happens and, and, and you use that data that gets generated from the experiment to essentially do something like a regression or a supervised learning technique uh, and thereby uh, make decisions. So, design of experiments is would be uh, one way of going forward there. Um, this is other really exciting uh, area called active learning, which is a part of the machine learning, uh, machine learning broader umbrella of machine learning. And the idea here is also one of, you can think of it as one of experimenting, 
you could think of it as one of uh, sequentially uh, querying the system. Uh, in other words, uh, active learning comes about when you might have some data um, or, or, uh, or very little data um, and it is fairly expensive to gather this data. So, instead of just doing a blind approach of fixing sensors all over the place which might be an expensive proposition uh, and therefore, you do not have this data. Is there something we can do with this partial knowledge and can we sequentially um, query the system and what we mean by querying the system here is can we sequentially put sensors, can we sequentially see which data we want to gather because we do not have a lot of data. Um, in, we do not have enough to make conclusions and at the same time we cannot just say okay, let us start, let us commission a data gathering exercise um, only because it is hard uh, to do that. Um, so, given that we have fixed resources towards gathering data, uh, active learning is an area where you sequentially uh, go and gather data, but you only gather um, the critical data that you need in order to uh, mine it or in order to process it for, uh, for uh, coming up with insights. Now, the third area that we uh, will be covering in this section which is creating data um, for, uh, for data analytics um, is the area of reinforcement learning and this is also reinforcement learning is also a subset uh, of the larger machine learning umbrella. And, um, more specifically in the reinforcement learning uh, arena, we are going to be focusing on a series of problems called the banded problems. Um, and the, the context here is that you do not start with, you do not have to start with any data or you might have some partial data, but you just cannot go about experimenting to create data for a variety of reasons. One, maybe you cannot create this kind of a lab setting which might be needed to conduct experiments and create data. Um, but more importantly, it is also possible that you cannot experiment only because it affects the end user in some way. You cannot essentially go offline um, and, and do your experiments. So, here you are, you do not have any data, you want to try some things, right? Uh, because you do not know if what you are doing is the best thing, but you cannot just commission an experimentation exercise to create the data which then gets analyzed and then tells you what is the best because when you are experimenting you might be doing some horrible things and those horrible things might affect uh, an end user. So, the, this, the, the whole idea behind banded problems is a, you can think of it, one way to think of it is a form of uh, experimentation and learning. Um, in an online setting. So, you do not only care about how much you are learning from the data, but you also care about how well you are performing. And in fact, the experimenting itself becomes a consequence because your grand objective uh, in the banded problems tends to be one of performing as well as you can over some time horizon. Um, so, because you need to perform as well as you can, uh, which is defined by some notion of how you do cumulatively, um, you wind up uh, trying a few things out just so that over time you are not continuously doing something that is not in your best interest. So, these are three, um, f these uh, could be fairly useful techniques or tools uh, to use when you are in an online setting or when you are in a setting where you do not have uh, much data. Finally, I just wanted to mention that in addition to some of these topics that we have discussed, uh, we are also going to have some a couple of modules on major challenges uh, for big data analytics and, and what uh, I guess big data analytics itself means in the world today. Uh, and we are also going to be talking about uh, some of the more popular techniques, uh, contemporary techniques like deep learning. Um, uh, especially when we cover uh, concepts in artificial neural networks and so on. Um, so, with that uh, we conclude this uh, second session uh, of the course overview uh, and uh, starting next 
session we would be directly diving into the content itself um, and, and I mean we covered the content today but again the spirit of it was to give you uh, an idea of what it is that we are going to be covering in this course um, and I hope you found it uh, interesting and I look forward to having you uh, join us uh, in the next session. Thank you.